Thursday night meditation. And I am Christina Munson, and I lead meditation every other week. Um, we have other teachers at the Padmasambhava Meditation Center, Brendan, um, who's taking the uh, alternate weeks. So I would like to begin tonight by just asking everybody here, anybody, do you have what thoughts, queries, challenges are you facing right now in your meditation? That's great. It, sound, it seems like it's going smoothly for everybody. <laughs> um, or it's just the end of a long day and nothing particular comes to mind. I wanted to say a couple words about thinking in the course of meditating. Before I do that, Let's do some practice together. Um, <clears throat> so to begin, wherever you are, bring your posture a little bit more upright. So that energizes a bit our awareness. Once again, knowing that a key point of meditation is, as we can, to hold our body upright so that breath and the energy within the channels of our body can move freely. That's a key point. You could be sitting on a chair, you could be sitting um, on a flat surface, cross leg, however is comfortable for you. And let's start by just taking a couple deep breaths so that we can arrive here in this moment. It's morning for me, it's evening for you. And just with those breaths becoming really present in your body and connecting to that awareness of your body being supported by a seat which rests on the earth. You can even exhale a little bit longer than usual. Just a sense of kind of letting go of whatever might be a distraction for you that you bring with you from your day. We're going to start by just a simple practice of shamatha meditation, letting our minds settle down. And so we do this using either the breath as our focal point or an object, if that's easier for you. And bringing our attention to that focal point, if it's the breath, we emphasize the exhalation. Traveling out with our exhalation and dissolving as it does. And using that as our focal point, we just settle right down into a state of peaceful abiding.
And you notice your attention dispersed or distracted, just bring it back to the object that you're grounding yourself with, your breathing, or an object that you're focusing on in front of you.
When you are meditating and thoughts arise, how do you deal with them? Hi, Margo. Welcome. Does anybody have any thoughts arise? I always have a thought. <laughs> have a, um, when I'm meditating and a thought arises, there's two things that happen. One is I get chased the thoughts completely and get lost in thought, and then realize that and, and just simply bring myself back to you know, awareness. Um, sometimes I, if I'm not lost in thought, but I notice thoughts coming up, I just, I don't say, oh, I'm thinking, or you know, anything like that. I just, without any, like, keeping it neutral, I just go back to more focus on awareness itself. But I know some people, like Tara, some teachers just say something like, I notice I'm thinking and just go back to the meditation. Because otherwise, you just say like, I notice I'm thinking in a neutral way. You're not having a negative judgment. Like a lot of people get frustrated or negative. Oh, I'm thinking too much. Or, you know, I shouldn't be thinking. So just saying like, I know, oh, I notice thinking and then go back. I, I don't do that myself, but it is the more, the less um, emotion, emotional judgment you put into it, you're just sort of digging a deeper hole. So, and, and also thoughts just are like, they're very insubstantial. They're just like little sm smoke that comes up and disappears. So they're not really solid. It's only when you really get lost in thought that you lose awareness completely. But if you're semi-aware and this thought comes up, it's easy just to um, see it as just like a cloud blowing by in the sky or smoke or and not have a judgment that you're having a thought because you can't really stop thinking. Thank you. Can you stop thinking? Yeah, I, I became curious about this. And it's kind of the reason that I wanted to talk about thinking tonight, this morning. I was thinking about what is it to disentangle? And what is entanglement with thinking? I was thinking about this practice, the practice that we just did, shamatha meditation. So it's often translated as I just did peaceful abiding. Sometimes we also say, and I was thinking very much about the Tibetan translation of this Sanskrit word shamatha. So shi ne, these are the words in Tibetan. At one point I think I also mentioned kind of a sacred place of peace. That's another way that we could translate those two words as they come to us in Tibetan language, a sacred place of peace. And so I appreciate that Brad there in his car can be in a sacred place of peace. This is a practice whereby we can find ourselves in a sacred place of peace wherever we are. And I was reflecting on the metaphors that we often use to talk about this. So the, the dirt settling down in a glass of water when you leave it still. And some natural clarity then. A clear quality of water is always there, right? You could never separate clarity of water from the essence of water, right? It's only that if it's filled with mud and stirred up that way, we don't see that clear quality. And then when it's just left be and all the grit settles down, 
the clear nature of water that has always been there, it's never been separate from it, becomes apparent. I like that image very much. And yet, as I was reflecting more on it, it brings a strong sense of thinking starting to lessen, to be reduced, to somehow fade away. And so I was wondering about that. Is, is that your experience with this practice? What have you noticed about your own thought activity? Through your meditation? Anybody? Hi, Christina. Hi, hey. I seem to chase the thoughts less as time goes on with the meditation practice. So that they're there, but I just don't seem to chase them. And uh, when you brought up the, where is the thought, where does it come from? We were talking about that a little bit last week. And I thought about, um, being out on a camping trip years ago and watching, um, getting up in the middle of the night and t going outside and watching a meteor shower. Mm -hmm. And just that sort of reminds me of why it's so futile for me to chase a thought because I see that and then, okay, then where do I go from there? It's just kind of, if I just be in the space, if I allow myself to be in the space, then they're happening, but it's not like I'm trying to, chase after them which feels very much futile mm -hmm. like a wasting time thank you um yeah <laughs> another image that just came into my mind was like catching fireflies but you know you can catch fireflies i i caught a firefly the other night they just started to come around here and i uh, I went outside and then, you know, they'll land on you. I, fireflies are not actually difficult to catch. And then it was just, oh, yeah. it's very beautiful, fireflies. Um, so thoughts can be there. And yet we're not entangled in them. That's one thing that I, I hear you're saying. And, and it's Carol saying kind of they're like these little puffs of smoke. Um, sometimes they are. And sometimes they can be more like a tidal wave, right? <laughs> or, or a wave with a strong undertow, at least. It's kind of like, because <clears throat> it, they can bounce back, right? If there's something that's really disturbed you, right? If there's something, a powerful emotion, related to a situation. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with that in meditation? That's, that's almost exactly what I was going to share, Chris. Um, for me, over the course of years of meditating, there's a difference. There wasn't a difference at the beginning of, oh, I have to go to the store later, or, oh, I forgot to do that thing, or, oh, so-and-so, I need to respond to, the, you know, these kind of practical, you know, thoughts that you can get. How do I solve this problem is even a more complicated thing you could get entangled with or something. Um, these days, those thoughts, it feels like it's easier to make space for and not get entangled with but the real the, the subtler emotional experiences that pop up in the middle of a quiet moment like you even think oh i thought i was done with that <laughs> there it is right in your face 
um, they, that, they feel more tenacious. The kind of deeper emotional experiences feel, and it also feels less of a, like I have, or my mind has less control over those um, tenacious emotional experiences. Um, that it's not me choosing to be entangled like I would with a grocery list. You know, it's saying, I can think about the grocery list later. Let me put that aside. But it's more of a, uh, like, even a physical or somatic experiential event where my chest is heavy and it's associated with, you know, we can label, 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 associated with depression, associated with some kind of anxiety, associated with elation. You know, I'm so excited about something that just happened. Um, and I'm, I'm finding that I can um, identify those better and better, um, but not necessarily find the space where it, it feels the same as that grocery list. That I'm like, here's the, here's the space, and, and it can exist in, in the space somewhere, however we're conceiving of that. Um, it's more like I'm there in the space with it. And at least I can open it up, and then it's just me and me and that feeling, mm -hmm. and my breath for for a while, <laughs> maybe over and over and over and over again, and then it goes, and then it's another feeling the next time like that. Thank you. Yeah, and some of the the, the some of those feelings take up a lot of space. <laughs> they they have a very different energetic quality than just what am I going to make for dinner tonight? Um, and are they different than any other thought? Well, this is something that has come up, I would say, in a couple sessions. And I, I wanted to go a little bit deeper into this today. Are emotions what is the difference between thoughts and emotions? How would you describe that? I suspect. And I suspect there's definitely no right or wrong answer. Right. <laughs> they feel this. They feel the same. They feel equally as um, active or it's kind of a, um, yeah, the, and sometimes I get caught up with, with a lot of study of these things, so um, I know what it says in the text. <laughs> so then instead of trying to experience, are they the same, or investigate on my own accord, I already go to, oh yeah, they're the same. Oh, you know, so-and-so teacher said, it's all, it's all this thing. <laughs> so Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that distinction a lot, Tracy. And when I ask that question, I'm asking all of us. I'm asking myself. There, I, there's no right answer. I don't have any answer in mind. But I have found that the question itself is useful for my own practice. And I, and I, I ask the question as an invitation for all of you, just in your own experience, how, how, are, how, are, how is that distinction, if there is one, experienced in your own practice between emotion, how you describe emotion, and thinking? Thought. Janet? Yeah. I think for me, emotion has a place in my body too, and thought doesn't necessarily. So if I'm feeling a strong emotion, I check in, it's in my gut somewhere, or tightening of my chest or shoulders, or and and thoughts don't usually that to me uh -huh. yeah thank you so
So there's, there's a somatic component to emotions, a location in the body that we can plug into. There's a felt sense about it. When we really look, where is that feeling? And, and, and physically, there's a location, feels like. Feels like, yeah. Thank you, yeah. And thoughts, where are thoughts, right? Where are thoughts? When you say, I'm thinking, where do you point? Where would you point? Can you point here? And, and what's interesting is that in my experience, that can also be very cultural, right? Because many people point here. I think, I think. Is it our shared societal emphasis on cognitive ability? That's how we're trained, right? I think. And, and that thinking is just the domain of some processes going on in the brain, like cognitive neurological firings there. Um, who else? What else is either a distinction that you find between emotion and thinking or an overlap? In your own experience. Mark, were you going to say something? Oh, Margo, please. <clears throat> uh, I, I think for me, what, what my experience is, um, and somebody shared this already, you know, thoughts are thoughts. Um, but the emotion, it's what I think the common denominator for me is when I have a vested interest. Mm. And if there is something that causes me to emote, whether it be joy, happiness, anger, resentment, what, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a vested interest there for me. And, um, you know, I've, I have never sat on the cushion and finished a, a meditation practice and gotten up and said, gee, I just didn't think enough. And, um, I <laughs> <laughs> that I, what meditation has taught me is to not let that be a distraction, not let those thoughts be a distraction from my meditation practice. But when there's an emotion that arises through my meditation, um, there's something underlying that's simmering. And what that underlying current for me is typically, and the one thing I can kind of point to as the common denominator, is a vested interest. Um, of some type, right? Somebody I care about is sick. Somebody um, uh, at work uh, is not minding. Um, you know, there's a lot of different variables there. So I think when I look at that, um, you know, thoughts are fleeting, kind of like Carol just described earlier. I like that analogy of the smoke. And, you know, they come and they go. And, and I've learned through my practice to just sit with that. But when the emotion arises, I find I have to sit a little better. <laughs> um, Margo, thank you. Can you, may I in, invite you to expand a little bit on what that looks like? What is, how does that work? How do you sit a little better? Well, it's um, typically for me, it's uh, what I realize is that if I haven't, if I haven't been consistent in my meditation practice, it takes me longer to get settled. And, um, you know, sometimes I get distracted with practice. I, I want, rather than just sitting, I get into practice, right? And so um, sometimes, sometimes I just need to sit for, you know, an hour. And I find that when I sit early in the morning at, when I arise, um, typically my mind is not moving already. Um, 
I, I can let those thoughts come. Um, but when the emotion arises, I feel that um, I really do some introspective work that results in me uh, looking at one, what's my part in this emotion? Uh, so for me, the, the natural thing that I go to is what am I trying to fix, quote unquote, whether it needs to be fixed or not. Um, and so there's, uh, so I have to back out and say, this is not my responsibility to fix this. I can support, I can be kind, I can be compassionate. Um, but this emotion that I'm having, uh, you know, it comes back to me. And that's the piece that I have to do the introspective work with. Um, thank you very much for sharing that, Margo. It ties very much into two weeks ago, um, and Faith brought this up as well, the practice of examination, analysis. Where do thoughts, and, and, and I talked about this in the, in the context of thinking at that time, where do thoughts come from? Where are they when they're here? Like, really, where are they? Is it, is it, like, is it a thing right inside my head? Or is it outside? Does it have form? Not, there's kind of a whole process. And then when it's gone, thoughts, go, where did it go? Where is it? And what I hear in what you just said, Margo, is that there's also a, an analytical process that is part of your practice when emotions come up that allows some kind of deeper insight about what's going on with them, what information they're bringing to you. As a, and, and tell me if this is right, but that, that helps you in, in the practice of sitting, then also to return to your aware, open, grounded meditation practice. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Because that, that was really where I, I was interested in having some discussion tonight. How do we integrate analysis of thought slash emotion into a non-conceptual sitting meditation practice? How does that work? How does it look? What does it make possible for us? So I really, I, I very much appreciate you're letting us glimpse into how you do that with emotions. Um, who else, who else has a thought or an experience on that? A question about it? Mark, yeah. Yes. Um, for two weeks ago, when you gave us the listening practice, mm. and I've been taking that to heart over the past couple of weeks in my meditation practice. Mm. And what I've noticed um, at times anyway, is that whether it's an external sound or a so-called internal thought, they're both sounds in a way. And they're both, there's really no difference between the thought and an external sound. If I can have that distance of just simply observing them. And I was reading a couple of weeks ago of Long Chimpa saying that all sounds and form and thoughts are ornaments of basic space. And I was taking that attitude that when, this, when a thought appears or when a sound appears outside, it is, it's like a clothing or an ornament of space. And that has helped me to have a little bit of distance. So I don't, because as soon as I grab on, <laughs> off we go, you know, like, like wild horses, mm -hmm. so having that distance. And then at times there's no thoughts and it's just this wide open space and it's just beautiful. Mm. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, 
I'm not sure if, if everybody here was with us two weeks ago. In that session, I introduced a, a technique, I call it 360 hearing. And it's a technique that I use to expand and connect to the vastness and spacious quality of awareness, of conscious awareness, which is in some ways, as you beautifully just described, Mark, the, the container within which all of thought, emotion, other perception unfolds, arises, and then disappears. Um, so that was a practice in which um, through sitting and becoming aware of how our hearing faculty is not limited by directionality. We can hear sounds behind us just as we can hear in front of us. And to start to kind of become aware of how you can listen 360 degrees all around you, you can listen up, you can listen below. It allows kind of an expansion into that larger spaciousness. I find, I find that it's a helpful practice to do that. Um, and when I think about, all right, how do I work with thoughts and emotions. And in my own analysis of how these two things are connected, what I've seen is that sometimes an emotion may seem to precede thinking about it. Other times it definitely follows on a thought. I can start thinking about something, and, and um, I can also do this very skillfully, to induce a certain emotion. There are definitely some topics that I could choose to think about, and I can pretty much guarantee an emotion is going to follow right along. Um, or sometimes it's just a feeling that seems to come out of nowhere, but when I pay attention to it and it's um, sometimes simultaneous sometimes there's a bit of a longer gap the information that it has for me what's going on what the investiture is what the entanglement is in that then becomes more apparent conceptually to me I find it difficult to tease apart fully concept and emotion. Um, so in some ways then I, I lump them together in terms of my meditation practice. They have different qualities to them and yet they are possibilities for distraction, each and of themselves in, in their own ways. So one way is to give them space so that vast expansiveness that is a way that is, I would say, kind of part of the technique of 360 hearing, just we find ourselves just resting, sitting, inside a limitless expanse of conscious awareness. And then, yeah, there, there's thought in there, there's emotion in there, but we're not claustrophobic with it. There's plenty of room for everything. And therein, there's a rising and there's ceasing. And, and um, I would just say that's kind of one. And the other is the real core of shamatha which is I've chosen an object, whether it's my exhalation or another 
visual object, whatever it is. And that is going to be where I am distracted. So then thoughts and emotions are not going to be distracting me because that's what's distracting me. So it's kind of, it's in some ways the opposite approach. We become really focused and small, one pointed, honed in. And then other stuff arising, rising, it can't, it doesn't shake us from that. And stuff settles down. And in the vastness also, stuff starts to settle down. Um, in my experience, it's like that. And depending on my mood at the time or the busyness with which I come into a session of meditation, I might choose one of those two different approaches. And I want to come back to the analysis part of it. So how do we then integrate analysis of thinking or emotion with a meditation technique that we're using? How do you do that? Margot gave us a little glimpse into how she does. Anyone else? Look, can we do it in an inquiry way, such as you uh, had said, where did this thought come from? Where is it now? And where did it go? And that way of kind of anal analyzing through questioning the thought. And so it's kind of bringing that analysis into focus. Otherwise, we could go off into analyzing, or at least this mind could go off into analyzing anything, but of directing that analysis into questioning the, the nature of thoughts. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Absolutely. And what, I, what I'd like to do right now is invite us to do a practice of analytical meditation. So let's do this together now. Analysis of thinking slash emotion. And then we'll do this for, for a few minutes and then we will sit again. Um, and this is nothing that I am making up. This is not um, a technique that I have somehow come across. This is definitely, I would say, uh, a tried and true way alternating analytical meditation with resting meditation. Um, so let's do that. Let's do that right now and see um, what that does for us in terms of thinking. Um, and this part, analytical meditation, um, once again, invites us into a discipline. So just as you were going to sit in a regular session of resting meditation or practice, um, lifting your body as is comfortable, bringing forth that kind of energetic quality of awareness, letting yourself sink down with awareness, and bring your attention to a thought, a feeling that you're experiencing right now. And Be aware of what that thought or feeling is. As well as being aware of 
how you are relating to it. Maybe it's a thought about something pleasant, something happy. And it brings a warm feeling or a sense of lightness. And you want to stay with it. It feels good. And as you experience that, ask yourself and look for where it came from. Where did it originate? Can you locate a place, a point in space, in time, that is the source of that thought or emotion. Does that origin point have a form to it? Could you draw it? Does it have color and shape? And then as you let yourself think that thought connected to the feelings that are there with it, right here, right now, where is it? Is it inside of your body? If it's inside where? Does it have a form to it there, a shape? Could you taste it? Could you smell it? Is it outside of your body? Is it floating somewhere in the space near around you? Could you Grab it? Could you touch it? And now think something else. Think what time you're going to go to bed. Where did that previous thought, emotion, go? When another one took its place, did it go into the secret treasury U-Haul of every thought and emotion that you've ever experienced in your life that you're carrying behind you? Is it locked away in a trunk in the corner of your room? Where did it go? Where have all the different thoughts and feelings that you have experienced up to this very moment in your life, where are they right now? Really analyze, ask yourself, and in that process of analysis, thinking and looking, both together,
you can do this process of analysis until you feel a little bit tired. And now just drop it. Just drop it completely. With an exhalation, you travel out, dissolve, and drop right down into your present knowingness. Resting. Awake and aware. No more analysis. We are wide awake, thoughts, emotions come and go as they please. Thoughts and emotions come and go as they please. We don't stop them, we don't invite them. We simply rest, present, awake, aware. Now, if we were going to continue, what I would do right then is go back into analysis. Another thought, something that happened. Thinking about it, it's there, where, where, where did it all come from? Right then, it came up again, where did it come from? And I would spend a few more minutes really intensely thinking, analyzing, looking, pressuring my mind, my being, my whole body in that until finally I just That's part of this practice. 
one wears oneself out with the analytical part, get fully into it, and then drop it. Drop it. Um, it's very powerful. We can see, I, I think it, it works on many different levels, alternating analytical medicine, meditation and resting meditation. The more intense you get into the analysis, the more when you rest, it feels like you just, you know, put down a huge burden. You know, if you've been carrying a heavy load for a while, you just take off your pack and then whew. It doesn't have to be even long. This is a very powerful practice you could, you could do for 12 minutes, right? Two minutes analysis, two minutes resting. Two minutes analysis, two minutes resting. What I have found is that it helps us get a felt sense of the intangibility of conceptual activity and emotions. And sometimes emotions, for me at least, they're so strong that they're still there with me. <laughs> when I'm sitting. Sometimes they have a very different quality than just say a thought, like Carol said. And, and, and Margo pointed out too, there's something that is more entangling about emotion. And what I find is that, um, then, okay, <laughs> my irritation right now with my stepdaughter it's here. I, it hasn't been here this whole hour that I've spent with you. <laughs> but when we just did this practice, it was like, okay, all right, you can sit next to me here. Um, but actually, it wasn't sitting on my lap, which was definitely the case last night. <laughs> definitely, that was the case last night. So it helps then start to create a little bit more wiggle room around those emotions that can be strong and very sticky and tangling. The analytical part also, what I find helps us see that even though they can be more sticky and feel more powerful, no emotion that we've ever felt lasts forever. They also come and go, just like thoughts. They may cause a little more damage <laughs> or not. They don't have to. They also can be a source of great knowledge and insight, right? And that's what Margot was saying as well. There's something there that also, when she does analysis, she can see more deeply. Something I care about. And even in that process of analysis, maybe come to insight about something, an action she might want to take or not want to take. Margo, I may be projecting too much. Um, forgive me if I do. So the analytical point process of it can also be a source of wisdom. And I think that's the opportunity to start to create a relationship with our emotions and our thinking that serves us and shifts a sense of being controlled by. Um, so alternating, analytical meditation, and the core of that analytical meditation, where did it come from? Where is it right now? What does it look like? What does it taste like? How does it feel? What, where is it? Can I grab it? Can I catch it? And a net, firefly. Where is it? Where is it when it's gone? Where'd it go? I find the third one almost the most powerful for me personally. Where, 
Where is it? It felt so strong when it was there. But when it's gone, have you noticed this about emotions? Sometimes if we're in the grip of something, why is that powerful? And yet then when it's gone, it's gone. It's gone. Sometimes it takes a while for something to be fully gone. But even if we're dealing with an emotion coming back again and again, there's spaces in between there when it's not there. And when it's not there, where is it? What I find is that this practice as a whole helps us start to disentangle from an invested belief that all we think, all we feel, all that we're perceiving is true and real in the way that we assume it is. It starts to just kind of become more flimsy. And that gives us a lot more wiggle room. I'm going to shut up. That was a lot of talking. Thoughts. Reflections, insights, questions. I welcome. Carol? Well, I'm just going to say something that you remember she said to me once. He said that thoughts are just, uh, emotions are just a deeper, more intense level of thoughts, which really, you know, made me think made me think about it. You know, it made me um, ponder that, and I think it's true because emotions, are, you know, um, are still based around a story that we're telling ourselves that gives rise to an emotion, whether it's fear or anger or joy or sadness. It's all based on some some story we have that triggered it. So I, I think when he said the thoughts, emotions are just deeper levels of thinking, it kind of makes sense to me. They, they're kind of a continuum. They're not really separate. Thank you, Carol. I, I um, find that resonates with me very much as well. I've, I, I often find myself doing some analysis about um, could I have, am I having an emotion that is completely divorced from my storyline around it, right? And I, I, I would say that I'm, that's a point I'm still very curious about. Um, and sometimes if we have some very kind of intense thing that happens to us, like um, you might, if you almost die, like right on the spot or something because you've been poisoned um, and there's fear, right? It's almost, a quality of a non-conceptual heightened state of something that is emotionally based but not necessarily even that emotion anyway that's uh, i've spent quite a bit of time <laughs> analyzing that piece and i and i think why that analysis is helpful and it's something that we can do throughout our daily life as well we start to become um just more conversant with our emotional experience so that we can then even be very conscious about how we are relating to the emotions that we feel rather than just fully being those emotions when they're present. Anybody else? Thought or reflection, a question? Hi, Christina. Hi, Faith. I found kind of, this is a little bit just, I'm not sure about this. Um, I'm kind of going down two different paths with this analysis of, especially the emotion, the, either it's 
asking the question and saying, well, no, of course it's not. And then, no, of course I can't see it. I can't feel it. I can't taste it. Then the answer is always no. And then based on that, the conclusion is that there's no real inherent reality to that. And then the other road I go down is create creating um, kind of a visualization, a visual aspect of what color is it? Oh, it's kind of, ooh, it's dark, it's gray. And, you know, making it into something that's more, even more. So telling the story even more. So I go from shooting down the idea that it exists because I'm telling a story to making the story more exciting and dramatic so that I can say, wow, look how dramatic I was. And that's not real either. So kind of going two directions with that. Both of them sort of fun. Um, is it correct to assume that they end at the same place? Yes. <laughs> it vanishes, the whole visual yeah. <laughs> in, the way I, in, the, in the emptiness. Yep. You know what? That sounds um, absolutely fine, right? I, I would say <laughs> if, it, if they didn't end there, then you might want to revisit right <laughs> because you don't want to um solidify right and then start fixating on a solidified vision idea and so on that you have about them uh, what i also find that and you i appreciate this point that you know the questions in this analysis of origin abiding place dissolution place so you know does it have a color they may sound very rote and intellectually, we can say, no, of course, you can't grab a hold of a thought. Well, if you go to the lab at the University of Wisconsin, then they actually think that, you know, they, they've captured, right, on, um, with color and movement in at least um, a two-dimensional way, what they would say is thought activity. Um, it's real. It's worth sinking into these questions in doing the analytical part of the meditation as much as you can. Really asking yourself, even if say intellectually, I think no, of course, I couldn't grab a hold of a thought. But have I related to my thoughts that way? Have I used them as though they were even tangible objects by throwing them at other people? I mean, you can be as creative as you want with the analysis. I think the point is to evoke something in you, right? Really evoke a deeper experience of your own mind. And the intensity of the analysis is definitely then a counterpoint to that just dropping and resting. So the analysis can be ridiculous. That's also fine. Thank you. Um, the analysis could also be used on the spot, day to day, suddenly. You may, you're, you've been hijacked, <laughs> right? The amygdala emotional center of your brain suddenly has just kicked in and you're in fight or flight and you're overcome. Well, it's actually true at this point, what happens is the, the prefrontal cortex, that logical and rational part of our brain is less accessible to us. It's less available. If we're accustomed to doing this kind of analysis, and I'm not to say that, you know, our entire practice, meditation practice should be this no but if we become familiar with it and develop kind of um some sense of accustomed to questioning and looking into our experience it can be 
very helpful in those moments as well. At the very least, what we could remember is, oops, stop. <laughs> stop. I'm in the grip of something. And that can cut the cycle of reactivity, at the very least. <laughs> Let's try it this, this next two weeks. Analytical meditation interspersed with resting meditation. <sighs> try it for just 10 minutes a day, neither at, at the end or the beginning of a session of practice. Sometimes when you come into a session of practice and your mind is really busy, this also can be a great way to kind of, oh, you know, I've got all this activity. All right, I'm going to get into some analysis. It's thinking. It is conceptual. And then <laughs> enough of that now. Notice the quality of your attention awareness. So you just drop that then. Um, yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> sometimes I think maybe that approach is like, you know, if you want to stop eating chocolate, just binge, right? Just get the fudgiest, densest, darkest chocolate cake and eat as, you know, as much as you, I actually haven't done this because I've, oh, Has anyone else ever done it? The chocolate cake thing? <laughs> Carol. <laughs> I think every night, but that's just it's a single serving concept. Right? It's a single serving concept. So. <laughs> single single serving. <laughs> I have ice cream, single serving, a gallon of ice. Single serving. Looks like we lost Christina. Maybe she'll pop back in. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye, Margo. Yeah, thanks, everybody. I'm, I'll wait and see if Chris comes back, but um, thanks. Brendan, she went and some like, chocolate cake. Right, she went and found some in the middle of the village in Nepal. <laughs> Thank you. She couldn't control herself. She had to go get the cake right now. <laughs> I love it. Um, I think Brendan's teaching next week, um, and then Chris will be back in two weeks. Uh, we're also starting a new cycle of six, a six-week class called, uh, that we decided, we've settled on the title of Buddhism Introduces You. <laughs> um, so it'll start on the 9th of June. Uh, at seven o'clock, our regular Tuesday nights, and it'll run for six weeks. So um, it's essentially an introdu introduction to Buddhism, um, looking at the Buddha's life and the three jewels, um, and how they apply, what what we can learn from them, how we can um, understand ourselves better by exploring these these concepts, um, allegorical, historical, fantastical, mystical. <laughs> All of them. Yeah. So uh, look on the Facebook page and we'll send out an email announcement this week for registration. Sorry. Yeah. Nice to see you all. I miss you all. I thank you. I hope you're all well. Thanks, Tracy. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. night, Mark. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, Ellie. Nice to see you. You too. <laughs>
going on here now, Tracy. I'm going to mute myself.